The, com the committee report. Sorry, the it, committee it reports. PM, the committee reports. It being 2 p.m., the committee reports progress. The committee reports progress. Thank you, Senator Askew, for stepping in. Sorry. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. After more than six years in government, the coalition is presiding over the worst wages growth since records began, almost two million Australians looking for work or for more work, household spending growing at its slowest pace since the GFC, declines in real living standards and the first labour productivity decline on record. Which of these measures demonstrates that the Morrison government has any economic plan at all? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Repeating something that is wrong again and again doesn't make it come true. Uh, so let me just say again, real wages growth today is stronger than it was under the Labor Party. Real wages growth is stronger than it was under the Labor Party. Let me tell you something else. In the last quarter, we had two, the disposable income of Australians increased by 2.5%, more than 5% over the last year. Uh, the highest for many, many years. And uh, indeed, I mean, under our, under our government, the economy is growing more strongly than it would have uh, if uh, the Australian people had chosen $387 billion in higher taxes instead. Uh, of course, I mean, our economy in Australia continues to grow. More than 1.4 million new jobs have been created uh, during our period in government. And indeed, I mean, employment growth consistently uh, is stronger than the uh, long-term average. And so that means that more Australians, more Australians uh, are in work uh, than ever before. More Australians are paying personal income tax, uh, lower personal income tax. And the number, the proportion of working age Australians on welfare is at a 30-year low, at a 30-year low. Uh, our economy continues to grow, where uh, quite a number of other economies are actually shrinking. We maintain a triple I rated economy. Uh, and I mean, you know, the Labor Party, of course, seems to completely ignore the fact that there are obvious global economic headwinds. Obvious global economic headwinds. They completely ignore that there are obvious, obvious challenges in our domestic economy, uh, principally related to the drought, absolutely devastating drought in large parts of Australia. The Labor Party thinks that that doesn't matter at all. Our economy, actually, in all of the circumstances, is performing uh, quite well. It's performing much better than it would have if the Australian people had chosen a change of government at the last election. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday's national accounts revealed annual GDP growth remains below trend, with a one in front of it. The private domestic economy went backwards in the quarter and over the past year, with dwelling and business investment continuing to fall. Which of these outcomes demonstrates that the Morrison government has any economic plan at all? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, what the uh, September quarter national accounts showed is that uh, economic growth in Australia has actually uh, increased, increased. So annual, annual economic growth. Annual, annual economic growth in the September quarter uh, increased, increased. Uh, so I mean, I, I don't. So what? The Labor Party is now saying the fact that growth is increasing is a bad thing. Economic growth increased. Our Order. economy continues to grow. Our economy continues to grow. Our economy continues to grow at a time when other economies around the world actually were shrinking because they, like us, are facing global economic headwinds. But Australia is dealing with them better, comparatively better than other economies around the world. Now, and, and I say it again. Uh, I say it again. The Australian people understand very well that the economy is performing better than it would have if it had been hit by Labor's socialist, anti-business, high-taxing politics of envy agenda, which would have made our economy weaker, would have led to uh, lower employment growth, higher unemployment and lower wages over time. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Australians are rightly worried about the economy, but the Morrison government continues to pretend that there is no problem. When will the government finally produce a plan to get the economy moving? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, Morrison government absolutely does not pretend that we uh, are not facing challenges. Of course, we are facing challenges. I mean, we've been very open and transparent in the lead-up to the election and since. 
that the Australian economy is facing global economic headwinds and downside risks in the domestic economy. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious. I mean, that's actually documented in our budget papers, and we've made that very clear all the way through. But we're also optimistic about the future. Uh, on, the back, on the back of our plan to build a stronger economy and create more jobs involving lower taxes, in particular lower income taxes uh, for hardworking families around Australia, uh, lower taxes for business. I, mean, I know the people here, are there, um, Senator Keneally is yawning. She's obviously very bored about the fact that we are building a stronger economy. Or, uh, Senator Keneally on a point of order. <laughs> the Leader of the Government just reflected upon me. I think if we go to the video wrap, it will show I was not yawning. I Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, if that wasn't a yawn, I don't know how she yawns. If that wasn't a yawn, I don't know how she yawns. Now, uh, Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, under our government, we are working very hard to put Australia and Australians on the best possible foundation, Order, Senator economic Cormann. foundation trajectory Time for the, for the answer future. Expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister inform the Senate on how the Morrison government's plan is working to make Australia even better, and what are the government's key achievements over the past year? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I very much thank Senator Chandler for that question. Mr. President, well, firstly, um, after, for the first time in 11 years, our budget returned to balance uh, this, this year, and of course we are on track uh, to deliver the first surplus budget uh, in 12 years. Since uh, the election, uh, we have delivered and passed in legislation through this chamber a further $158 billion worth of uh, income tax relief for more than 10 million uh, Australians, uh, including immediate tax relief for low- and middle-income earners to ease the cost of living. Uh, this, of course, built uh, on our personal income tax plan, which was legislated the year before, uh, which means that we have now pursued the most comprehensive tax reform, uh, personal income tax relief and personal income tax reform since the uh, mid-1990s. In fact, uh, we have abolished an entire tax bracket. About 94 per cent of Australians uh, will not pay more than 30 per cent tax on any of their income. Uh, we have been able to grow employment by adding a further 250,000 new jobs over the last 12 months. Uh, we have expanded and extended the instant asset write-off for small business, which employ 5.7 million workers. Uh, we have, of course, uh, passed legislation uh, to deal uh, with market miscon misconduct in the energy market, something that the Labor Party initially uh, criticizes for and then supported. Uh, we have uh, indeed we've given vital support to our farmers through increases in the uh, farm household allowance investment and of course we've also established the Future Drought Fund, the $5 billion Future Drought Fund. In recent weeks we have brought forward more than $3.8 billion in infrastructure investment, which of course uh, will help to strengthen the economy, uh, create more jobs and get Australians uh, home sooner and safer. Uh, we've, been able, we've been able to list more life-saving medicines on the PBS. Every child asylum seeker has now left Nauru and Manus, and we've closed 19 detention centres since 2013. Since the 2018 budget, we've invested $2.7 billion in 44,000 new home care packages. The Parliament recently ratified three important trade agreements with key uh, trading partners, Order, opening Senator up new Coleman, export opportunities in Indonesia, Hong Kong and expired. Peru. Senator, Chan Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government's plan securing our future and supporting record employment and improved living standards for all Australians? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, all, of our, all of our reforms are designed to ensure that individual Australians and businesses around Australia have the best possible opportunity to be successful, the best possible opportunity uh, to get ahead. Uh, by making it easier for businesses to be successful, that helps them hire more Australians and pay them better wages over time. Uh, by making sure that Australians uh, get to keep more of their own money as a result of our income uh, tax relief. Of course, that means that they will spend that money in the economy over time, helping to boost economic growth and create more jobs. By making sure that we keep uh, finalising and negotiating and successfully finalising uh, free trade agreements like the one that was legislated the other week uh, with Indonesia, we help our exporting businesses get better access to markets around the world, uh, in particular in our region. And as our exporting businesses get better access to markets around the world and get more successful and more profitable, they are able to hire more Australians and pay them better wages over time. And of course, there is so much more to talk about. I'm limited by time, but there's so much more in our plan Order. that helps Senator Australians Senator Coleman, get ahead. time for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, how is the government's plan addressing the risks Australia faces, and is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? 
Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, Australia is a globally focused open trading economy, so that means it cr that creates a lot of opportunity for us to uh, continue to lift our living standards, but it also exposes us to risk because obviously uh, what happens in the global economy matters uh, to the Australian economy. And that is why we are working to ensure that we are internationally as competitive as possible, that the Australian economy is as resilient as possible, in the best possible position to take advantage of opportunities and as resilient as possible possible to deal with headwinds. And I'm, I'm being asked, Mr. President, by Senator Chandler on whether I'm aware of any alternative policy approaches. Sadly, I have to say, sadly, I have to say I'm not aware of any alternative policy approaches because I think the Labor Party these days is a policy-free zone. A policy-free zone. I mean, what we've seen from the Labor Party since the election, in particular in this chamber, is nothing other than the pursuit of the politics of smear and innuendo. Nothing but the, the pursuit of the politics of smear and innuendo. And I hope that in 2000, 2020, we will see a different Labor Party, one that actually engages Order, the Senator policy Coleman. debates for our Senator nation. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Media reports have now named a staffer to Minister Taylor as the source of the doctored travel costs used in official ministerial correspondence. Did Minister Taylor's staffer, who is named in these reports, have any role in the preparation of the document? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. Well, I, I thought Senator Cormann just made a, a very appropriate invitation to the Labor Party that perhaps uh, as an opposition, as a political party in this parliament, they might occasionally like to think about policy issues at present rather than just political smear. But here we are, here we are. Less than a minute after Senator Cormann sat down and Senator Watt bobs up uh, and off he goes with yet more smear and innuendo. Mr President, as I told the chamber the other day, as I told the chamber the other day, the opposition has asked for an independent police investigation into this matter. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. This question doesn't go to the police investigation. It goes to your staff members. Order. Your order, staff Senator members Birmingham. and what your ministers knew about their staff members' role in the document. Uh, on the point of order, Senator Cormann. O on the point of order, I mean, <coughs> Labor initiated a uh, investigation, and that is an investigation that should. It's an investigation that should be allowed to take course independently. Uh, and uh, the question that absolutely related to the police investigation, which Labor, which Labor initiated, and in any event, in any event, there's a long-standing convention on both sides of politics Order. that we do not drag individual staff into okay. these matters. You, refer, you, you go and have a check what Senator Order. Faulkner Senator used to Corbyn, say on the hands of record in relation to these matters. On, on, the, on the point of order, um, the earlier comments of the minister were probably not directly relevant, but I note he has now turned to the issue at hand. I am listening very carefully, and uh, I am not yet willing to rule what he is saying is di not directly relevant, but I am listening very carefully because he has turned to the subject matter of the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. The accusation in the media that Senator Watt comes in and poses his question based upon uh, is clearly related to the police investigation that the Labor Party have requested. This is an independent police investigation. The government is not going to compromise it in any way. We've indicated we will cooperate with it, and I am certainly not going to speculate based on media reports about matters that are subject of that police investigation. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Can the minister rule out that the staffer named in these reports did in fact doctor the document? If so, if he can rule it out, where did Minister Taylor get this document? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, once again I point out to the Senate uh, that Minister Taylor, Minister Taylor has been clear all along that the document was downloaded from the City of Sydney website. So I reject the assertion uh, based in Senator Watt's question based on the statements that Minister Taylor has made. In relation, to, in relation to the staff member in question, you do have to wonder why the Labor Party went down the path of writing to the police and asking for this investigation if they now want to come into the chamber and conduct the investigation themselves via Senate question time. Why won't they just let the New South Wales police do their job? Order. Order. 
Senator Watt is on his feet. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Watt is on his feet. Senator Watt. Thanks. How long has Senator, Minister order, Taylor Senator known? Watt, please see. Senator Watt and Senator Wong and Senator Rennick. Order. Senator Wong, please. I've got Senator Watt seeking the call. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. How long has Minister Taylor known that his own staffer was the source of the doctored documents? How long has he known this and stayed silent when he was asked about this repeatedly in the House of Representatives? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, once again, I point Senator Watt to the assurance that Minister Taylor has made in relation to the source of the documents being that they were downloaded from the City of Sydney website. And again, I refer Senator Watt to the reality that this matter is subject to an independent police investigation, and they ought to let that investigation Order do its job independently left. without the Senator interference Watt. of the Labor Party. Order on my left. Senator Dinatale. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Drought, Natural Disasters and Emergency Man Management. The Greater Sydney region has been choking on bushfire smoke for days. The fires along the east coast have been burning for weeks, and conditions in Queensland are worsening today. Yesterday, the United Firefighters Union of Australia passed a unanimous resolution at its national council calling for, and I quote, the urgent phase out of coal, oil, and gas because they're driving more dangerous and intense fires. Minister, can you tell us why the very people can you tell us why the very people who are putting their lives on the line to keep us safe are wrong? The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, well, on behalf of the Minister for Emergency Services, uh, Minister Littleproud, our focus as a government and his focus as the minister responsible has been on ensuring that state governments that are dealing with uh, the early onset of a horrific bushfire season have the resources and the focus that we can supply as a federal government, uh, and that has come in a raft of uh, areas. We want to make sure that these fires are um, managed, uh, put out as soon as possible, that people and property are protected, uh, and you know that we work with state governments and don't get uh, in the way that we've actually got disaster relief on the ground uh, for these communities and for individuals. Um, you know, and we've prosecuted this several times, Senator Di Natale. If you're trying, I don't know what you're actually trying to ask me to do. Solar panels on fire trucks? I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure what you want here. But I can tell you that the people who are facing these fires, who are trying to protect, trying to protect stock, uh, trying to protect Order. family and households, uh, uh, actually don't need to hear this sort of trite, glib politicisation of uh, an emergency situation. Uh, we are focused on the right things. We're trying to focus on keeping people and property safe and secure and supporting them to get back on their feet uh, post bushfire. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, well, if we're going to resources, the firefighters have also demanded a national approach to firefighting to improve compatibility of different state and ter territory services, as well as boosting the number of professional firefighters. Now, Minister, that means an increase in resources by two thirds over the decade. If you're so concerned about making sure they have the resources they need, will you commit to that figure? Senator Mackenzie. Well, uh, Senator Dean and Tali, we're doing a lot to coordinate a national response to, to deal with um, disasters. We've developed a national disaster risk reduction framework to guide national action to address existing disaster risks and to minimise new risks. We've invested $130 million dollars over the next five years to deliver disaster risk reduction initiatives at the national, state and local level. We have also established the Emergency Response Fund to provide a sustainable way to fund disaster risk reduction effort. We have also invested over $6.2 million on the next generation of Australian fire danger rating system to deliver more accurate and local risk messaging providing $2 million to ensure the Commonwealth's component of the national telephone-based warning system, Emergency Alert, is available. 
We have also invested $1.9 million towards the development of a public safety mobile broadband capability, and we are also helping communities recover from disasters. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator yeah. Ginitali, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the firefighters have also said that now is absolutely the time to talk about climate change and the ever more intense fires being fought by their members, despite the fact that fires are currently burning. Minister, can you tell us why the people who are risking their lives to keep us safe are wrong and why you're right? Senator McKenzie. Well, Senator Di Natale will say it again. The, our government accepts the science of climate change. We are working very, very hard, along with industries, state governments and the like, to reduce the emissions in this country, to meet our international obligations. We've also got a suite of uh, practical environmental measures, aside from emissions reduction, a $3.5 billion climate reduction fund, which is going to help small businesses to move towards lower emission technologies. So to stand up and say we're not talking or doing anything about reducing our emissions uh, and acting uh, on climate change is an absolute misnomer. And you really have to actually reread the Hansard. I mean, we've done this dance, what, five times over the last five months? Oh, it's the same answer, Senator Di Natale, because you refuse to accept the fact that our government is taking tough action on climate change and supporting bushfire Order, communities. Senator McKenzie. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Energy Management, Senator McKenzie. Minister, questions have been raised by a former New South Wales Fire Chief about whether Australia's long standing practice of leasing fire fighting aircraft is sustainable as global fire seasons converge. The Commonwealth provides 90 per cent of the funding of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, which leases aircraft for use by state and territory governments. In less than a decade, the number of aircraft leased by the NAFC have almost tripled from 52 to more than 140. These aircraft come at considerable costs from private companies who lease to other countries such as Greece and the US. And the New South Wales government has recently started acquiring its own firefighting aircraft such as its new Boeing 737 air tanker. The state minister said that would give them uh, year-round access to aircraft. Is the federal government confident the NAFC has leased sufficient firefighting aircraft for this summer? The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Griff, for your uh, sensible question. And thank you for um, some notice so that I can actually provide you a, a, an answer. Um, aerial firefighting plays an important role in protecting communities and essential infrastructure and providing vital support to firefighters on the ground. Whilst aerial firefighting is one method of fire suppression, Fire and land management agencies across the jurisdictions use a combination of firefighting tactics prior to and during operations. The National Aerial Firefighting Centre was an incorporated company formed by states and territories with the assistance of the Australian government in 2003, and it is now uh, the business unit of the Aust Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authority Council. This represents a cost-effective method for the Australian government to deliver a critical emergency management capability. Commissioners and ch uh, chief fire officers within each jurisdiction work with the NAFC to determine the type and base location of aerial firefighting assets based on the assessed bushfire risk. The NAFC then coordinate, contract and uh, arrange the leasing arrangements. Minister Littleproud has written to the AFAC and the CEO advised the government that there uh, are enough aerial firefighting assets at present. So, Minister Responsible directly wrote asking do you have what you need, uh, given the context that you're fighting these uh, fires in? Uh, and they have returned that they do at present. Uh, however, the government remains open to requests for further assistance, and that will continue to be a flexible arrangement with us responding as needed. We remain committed to supporting this important emergency management capability. Uh, the NAFC has contracts in place which guarantee a minimum number of aircraft are on standby during the fire season. These centralised contracts are the result of a collaborative procurement and evaluation process by the jurisdictions, and this is the case for both small local aircraft and the large aircraft, which are Order, mostly Senator sourced McKenzie. internationally. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, uh, thank you for your response. Uh, but as, as fire seasons last longer in countries like Greece and the US um, and start earlier in, in, in Australia, there is a risk that 
available leased aircraft over future years will be in use overseas and not be available for us here. What is the government's long-term plan to ensure aircraft are available when they're needed? Senator McKenzie. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Senator. Well, um, there, we have 147 aircraft um, that are leased at the moment, and these figures change throughout the bushfire season, depending upon assessed risk and the contracted time frames. And I'm happy to go through those. But in um, the interests of time, to your direct question, there is an apparent trend of longer fire seasons in both southern uh, and northern hemispheres. And although some firefighting aircraft are shared with the Northern Hemisphere, the National Area of Firefighting Aerial Firefighting Centre will contract 141 specialised aircraft across the country, and over three quarters of these remain resident in Australia year-round. The National Aerial Firefighting Centre acknowledges the potential challenge of longer fire seasons and the need to continue to closely manage international movement of resources. Senator Griffith, final supplementary question. In Canada, the federal government owns a fleet of firefighting aircraft which it leases out to provincial governments to support local resources. Has the federal government determined the value of and cost of if it were to purchase a core fleet of firefighting aircraft for Australia for future firefighting seasons? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. Well, firefighting aircraft are generally leased uh, due to the very high cost of purchasing and maintaining specialist firefighting aircraft. The Australian bushfire season typically occurs during the uh, off-season for US, Can Canada and European firefighting aircraft um, because it gives us greater flexibility to adjust resourcing levels based on forecast risk and the ability to cost-effectively introduce new technologies. These are the reasons that the Australian government at this time uh, has decided to lease uh, this capability rather than to purchase. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government's plan is working to ensure ambitious trade, our ambitious trade agenda supports Australian exporters in accessing new markets? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson for his question and his uh, absolute pursuit of open trade, access and markets for Australian businesses around the world. And Mr President, in the past fortnight alone, in the past fortnight alone uh, our government has successfully passed the necessary legislation to ensure that we can ratify the Indonesia, Hong Kong and Peru free trade agreements. We have released the government's response to the first ever industry-led services export action plan. We have seen record quarterly trade surpluses for the September quarter. We have chaired and overseen the inaugural Australia-Vietnam Economic Partnership meeting. The Joint Standing Committee on Treaties in this parliament has supported the Uruguay-Australia Bilateral Investment Treaty. And this week we have had export awards celebrating the contribution of Australia's best exporters to the Australian economy, as well as another monthly trade surplus and a record monthly service, services exports total. So, Mr President, that's just in the last two weeks alone. Throughout the course of this year, our government has overseen continued growth of opportunities for Australian businesses and exporters, our farmers and businesses across the country seizing the opportunities, and we're continuing to build new opportunities for them. Now, we have come to almost the point of closure in relation to negotiations on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, a regional trade agreement that will bring together 15 or 16 regional nations into a much tighter area of regional economic integration. We are in pursuit of negotiations with the European Union that have progressed successfully during the course of this year and that we trust can be concluded by the end of this year. In this year's budget, we provided more funding for the export market development grants to make it easier for Australian small and medium-sized businesses to get into export markets and indeed we've outlined new strategies and approaches through Austrade, supporting the development of our critical minerals industry, Order, hydrogen Birmingham. exports and Senator other future areas. Senator Patterson, area. a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Does the minister know of any Australian industries looking to capitalise on our recent free trade agreements with Indonesia, Hong Kong and Peru? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Australian farmers, businesses, services suppliers all stand energised in terms of the opportunities of these uh, recently legislated agreements which we trust will all come into, uh, into reality next year following complementary action in those other nations. 
And those types of sectors that we're going to see pursue opportunities, the farming sector in relation to the Indonesia agreement, uh, where there will be a zero tariff applied for 500,000 tonnes of feed grains under the Indonesia agreement, uh, a quota that will grow by some 5 per cent per annum. New opportunities for services businesses, particularly in the education space, to operate in Indonesia under that agreement. Lower costs for wine exporters as a result of the Hong Kong agreement through new labelling, labelling rules and more transparent regulations. Immediate duty-free access uh, into Peru for Australian wine, sheep meat, kangaroo meat and wheat under the Peru agreement. These are just some of the benefits, which is why industry has so widely and warmly welcomed these agreements as they are taking advantage of Order, our prior Senator agreements. Birmingham. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on any new statistics which show how the government's ambitious trade agenda is working? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, on Tuesday this week we had new ABS data which showed that Australia posted a record $21.1 billion trade surplus for the September 29 quarter. This is the highest trade surplus, highest quarterly trade surplus Australia has ever posted. It showed the highest ever quarterly goods exports of $103.5 billion and the second highest quarterly services exports of $24.8 billion. On top of that, today the ABS released only a few hours ago another monthly set of trade figures showing yet another monthly trade surplus for Australia of $4.5 billion. States are seeing good gains across New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, ACT and my home state of South Australia, an increase of 9 per cent in their latest export data. Some 22 consecutive months and in celebrating such successful businesses such as Populous, our Australian Exporter of the Year, a Brisbane-based company, an architecture company Order. who Senator has designed Birmingham. stadiums Time such as Yankee Stadium in New York. Senator Farrell. Sitting down. Um, Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the Australian National Audit Office's ongoing investigation into Senator Mackenzie's mismanagement of the Community Sport Infrastructure Grant Program. Uh, this investigation was first due to report in September, then listed for November, and now, with any, uh, without any update from the Minister, the National Audit Office websites now reads uh, January 2020. Did the minister, his office or any member of the government have any communication with the National Audit Office about the timing of this audit and its release? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Farrell, for the question. Uh, the timing of the uh, release of the audit is a matter for the Australian National Audit Office. It's not something that I have sought or my office has sought. Uh, it is a, a function of the process of the audit process being conducted by the Australian National Audit Office and is effectively a matter for them to decide uh, as and when they will report. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, uh, when was the minister or his office first informed that this investigation into Senator Mackenzie's mismanagement was taking longer than first expected. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, firstly, I um, uh, disagree with the characterisation uh, that uh, Senator Farrell has put on the, the um, management of the program. Uh, and, and, my office, and my office became aware of it, of the <coughs> change in the date of reporting uh, when it appeared on the ANAO website. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, why has the release of this audit again been delayed? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Farrell. Uh, as I indicated in my answer to his primary question, that is a matter for the ANAO, and questions in relation to that would be best directed to the ANAO. It's not a matter for my department. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Small and family businesses make a very substantial contribution to the Australian economy. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's plan is working to support small and family businesses, including over this Christmas and New Year period? 
Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question. And uh, the coalition government is proud to be putting in place policies that support small and family businesses in Australia. And Senator Henderson is right. Small and family businesses are the backbone of the Australian economy. Uh, and in fact, there are 3.4 million small businesses in Australia, and they employ around 6 million Australians. So every day, around 6 million Australians wake up and they go to work because of a small business in this country. Small and family business, they are the engine room of the Australian economy, and their impact on the Australian economy cannot be understated. And in fact, our Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, recently stated, Small and medium-sized businesses are responsible for more than three quarters of the output in agriculture and more than half the output in construction. Mr. President, it is without a doubt that small and family businesses in Australia collectively they well and truly punch above their weight. They are the true lifeblood of our economy, but they're also the true lifeblood of so many of our communities out there, and in particular in rural and regional Australia. Mr President, as a government, when you deliver policies that ensure that small and family businesses are able to prosper and grow, you don't just support the small business. You also support the community in which the small business is thriving. You support that small business to take on their additional staff member. You support that small business to be able to sponsor that local sports club, to train their first apprentice. Mr President, a very real way that all of us all of us are able to make a difference this Christmas is by shopping locally, using the money that we have, if we're going to be out there spending, to actually support the small businesses uh, that rely on us every day. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any initiatives which help Australians support small and family businesses this Christmas? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, and I am, and it is an initiative of someone on this side of the chamber, and that is, of course, Senator Holly Hughes. Senator Holly Hughes, and I thank her for her work for launching the Go Country for Christmas initiative. Mr President, the Go Country for Christmas initiative is a movement that encourages all Australians to embrace small and family businesses in rural and regional Australia. Um, the Go Country for Christmas official website is a one-stop shop, and what it does is it connects Australians with rural and regional businesses. The online portal is very easy to use. You just need to Google Go Country for Christmas. And if you would like to support a rural and regional business and buy something from them, you're able to do this. Uh, Senator Hughes informs me that there are almost 300 businesses have actually signed up to the Go Country for Christmas website, uh, and it is an initiative that has been supported by all sides of the chamber. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Minister, how has the government's achievements over the year made it easier for small and family businesses this Christmas? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, small and family businesses, they are the lifeblood of the Australian economy. And on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government, we understand that when you put in place policies that ensure that small and family businesses are able to prosper and grow, you end up creating more jobs for Australians. Small and family businesses in Australia, 3.4 million, employing, as I said, over 6 million Australians. And that is why we are committed on this side of the chamber to making it easier for small and family business to prosper and grow. We've lowered their taxes because we understand the more money that a smaller family business has, they are able to invest back into their business. One of the things we do understand on this side of the chamber is red tape and the impact on it. And that is why we have set up our deregulation agenda and we are making life easier for small and family businesses by cutting red tape. Mr President, as we head towards the Christmas period, I'd encourage all uh, senators to shop Senator local, Cash, time support for the answer small and has family expired. Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to the Prime Minister, who professed that, and I quote, there's a shire expression. We have our own language. And if we like something, this is what we say. How good is? How good does the Prime Minister expect Christmas to be 
for the 120,000 older Australians his government has failed, who are waiting for the home care package for which they have already been approved. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th <coughs> thank, <coughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as uh, Senator Ayres obviously knows, is, uh, we've made a further a very significant uh, investment into providing additional access, additional access to home care packages. And that was, of course, uh, eloquently outlined uh, in recent uh, uh, days and over the last week or so by uh, our own Senator uh, Colbeck, the Minister for uh, Aged Care. And indeed, and indeed, and indeed, more than $500 million in additional, Order more than $500 million left. in additional resources, more than $500 million in additional resources. And of course, that is only the beginning. I mean, you would be aware, you would be aware that we do have a royal Order. commission uh, into aged care underway as we speak, uh, and we expect Senator there to be further recommendations. We have provided significant additional funding uh, in. Into supporting access, we provide significant additional funding to support access uh, to uh, relevant services, appropriate services uh, to people who require access to aged care, and there will be more to come. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question: How good does the Prime Minister expect Christmas to be for the almost two million Australians who are looking for work or for more work, and Australian workers who are struggling with the worst wages growth on record? Senator Cormann. Um, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, the Australian people have shown at the election that they can ru see right through these sorts of Labor lies. I think the Australian people have shown at the Order. election that they know a lie when they see one. Because worse wages growth on record, that is manifestly false. That is manifestly false. Real Order wages growth on my today left. is higher than it was when Labor lost government. Real wages growth today is higher than when Labor lost government. So don't come here with these sorts Order. of untruths. Because, I mean, in the lead up to the last election, you tried that and you failed. You tried that and you failed. And let me tell you, employment growth is significantly stronger under our government than it was under yours. More Australians today are in work than ever before as a result of the policies of our government. And indeed, Australians understand that if they had chosen another government at the election, that more of them would be unemployed, Order. that wages would be lower, and indeed that the and economy would be much worse off, which is why you're still sitting Order. on the opposition and benches. And you just still Senator, can't accept the fact that Senator, you lost the last election. Order. On, on, and here I was thinking everyone had been so well behaved for the first 40 minutes. Um, the interjections are getting so loud I can barely hear Senator Cormann myself. Senator Ayres. I'm sure it's not my influence, President. How good does the Prime Minister expect Christmas to be for Australians struggling to pay the bills, put food on the table and celebrate the holidays on just $40 a day? Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, for the last, for at least 25 years, for at least 25 years, for, for at least 25 years, New Start allowance has been indexed twice a year by CPI. That is under governments of both political persuasion. And at the last election, at the last election, Labor went to the election proposing 387 billion dollars worth of higher taxes. And do you know how much of that they allocated to increasing New Start allowance? Zero. Zero. So don't come in here with your hypocritical statements. I mean, after $397 billion Order on my right. higher taxes, not a single cent, not a zap Order on my additional right. resources and left. for New Start allowance. So that is just a hypocritical question. Order. Order. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal National Government's plan is working to support jobs in our resources sector, including projects like the Adani Mine? The Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, can he get to his feet before the interjections start on my left, please? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, there's been fantastic progress in resource projects right around our nation this year, especially, especially as the Senator Macdonald has expressed around the Adani Carmichael mine, which I know she's a big supporter of. Mr. President, it's been now it's been now 201 days since the federal election, since May 18, and now 
How good is it that there are 200 people employed at the Adani Carmichael mine site since then? So basically, Mr. President, in those 200 days, we've had one person a day get a job at the Adani mine thanks to the fact that this government stood up for jobs at the election. This government rejected the Labor Party's approach. The Australian people rejected the Labor Party's approach, which was to shut down jobs and shut down our great coal industry. Mr. President, those 200 people are helping drive and move around. 50 big yellow things, bulldozers, scrapers, water trucks, compactors, all being moved around at the Carmichael mine site now. And the fact there are 200 people there means that uh, there are now the work camp at the Carmichael site. The work camp is full. The work camp is full at the Carmichael mine site. I visited that work camp a couple of years ago, Mr. President. It was depressing. Depressing to see the delays that the Queensland government had presided over, have a work camp be empty, a gym be empty, a mess centre be empty. But now, a couple of years on, it is full of activity, and Santa Claus is going to be very busy on Christmas Eve, Mr. President, around the Galilee Basin, because there are a lot of people there working, a lot of people in jobs, a lot of people providing for their families, Mr. President. But it doesn't end there. The benefits of the Carmichael mine do not end there, because now contracts of more than $500 million have been provided to businesses all around Australia, including the other week, Wagner's, a $35 million contract to do work at the Carmichael mine site. That extends the benefits of backing projects like this to Toowoomba, to Rockhampton, to Mackay, to Townsville. All around Queensland are benefiting this Christmas from the fact that we are standing up for jobs, we are standing up for our great coal industry, we are making sure we continue to be a strong resources nation that provides Order, jobs Senator to Australians. Canavan. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How is Australia's resources industry contributing to our nation's continued economic growth? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, the resources sector continues to set more records than Ian Thorpe, Mr. President, because again this week, Mr. President, in the September quarter, we delivered a, a record, a record trade surplus for the quarter. Uh, driven by lots of great Australian industries, including our agricultural sector, but our resources sector provided a huge chunk of the growth, particularly over the last year, and increased LNG, coal and iron exports. In fact, for the first uh, 10 months of this year, uh, exports, uh, resources exports are $245 billion, a big increase on last year. Our total resource and industry exports year on year have increased by 19 per cent in just one year. 19 per cent. Uh, and uh, yesterday's national accounts, in fact, our growth showed that the resources sector accounted for one quarter of the total growth in that, in, in that quarter. Mr. President, it's only by backing sectors like the resources sector we can afford to pay for the public services and, and, and good welfare system that we have in this country. That's why we back this sector, and that's why Order, we'll always stand Senator up for it. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline any alternative approaches to jobs in the resources sectors, particularly in the regions? Senator Canavan. Well, Mr. President, um, we can because, Mr. President, this week there's been an update on that front. Because a few months ago, Mr. President, in this place, the, the Labor and Greens parties got together and supported a, an inquiry into jobs, into regional jobs, in fact. And with great fanfare, they, they wanted to develop, a, presumably, a plan, a policy around regional jobs in Australia. Well, the report came out yesterday, Mr. President. The report came out yesterday, and the majority report, Mr. President, from these two over here, the Labor and Greens, did not make a single recommendation for regional jobs. Not one recommendation from this group. Not one plan. Not one policy. Not one idea from the Labor Party still of supporting jobs in our regional areas, Mr. President. Because we know, Mr. President, at the election they did have a policy. They had a policy called the Just Transition Authority, which was all about shutting down the coal industry and putting people out of work. Well, Mr. President, I had a chance to reject that yesterday in that report. They were silent on that. They've still got a secret plan to back a transition authority, to put people out of work, and the Labor Party still haven't learnt the lesson to support Order, jobs in this Senator country. Senator Canavan, time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. And I refer the Minister to the article that was published in Tuesday's Sydney Morning Herald that titled McCormick Left in a Bind as Bush Support Dries Up. After hearing from the Deputy Prime Minister and the leader of the National Party, Michael McCormack, one protester asked, and I quote, Where's the passion? I haven't seen any passion from you. You're like a poker player. Get up there and say, this is not blanking good enough. Get angry. Why is the Senator Deputy Reddick. Prime Minister incapable of showing his passion and empathy for farmers who are struggling with the prolonged drought? The minister, I, I believe I heard correctly when I said the question was directed to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, 
Thank you for your question, uh, Senator. Um, look, everybody in the National Party, including and especially our leader Michael McCormick, are passionate about rural and regional Australia, about increasing local jobs out in the region, and you know, making sure that our regional communities have the support that they need to grow and develop. It's our party that took a an election promise many years ago around mobile black spot funding. That was the National Party. Around drought funding, that is delivered by National Party ministers. The minister responsible for ensuring our mining industry continues to grow and prosper and employ Australians right across regional Australia is a National Party minister. And the minister responsible for rolling out $100 billion of infrastructure to connect our uh, fresh clean green product from paddock to port and to markets around the world is the leader of the National Party, Michael McCormack. He's incredibly uh, passionate about making sure that our regions grow and develop and that we get the, what we need out there to make sure that happens. For everything from not just the practical pieces around roads and rail, uh, bridges, etc., but to make sure that we're opening up new markets uh, for that product, to make sure that we're backing our food processing sector and, and a range of issues like that. In my own portfolio, we're incredibly passionate about uh, and I think that was your intent of your question to ask how passionate we are. I mean I think it's actually incredible. It's incredible for a party that it didn't even have an agriculture policy at the last election for you to stand up here and criticise the side of politics that's actually backing agriculture, that's backing mining, and you don't have a plan for either. You want to shut the miners down and you want to make sure that agriculture can't, doesn't have a live sheep trade, you'd would have shut that Order, down. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you for the very passionate answer, Minister. Um, after listening to the Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the Nationals, the same protester argued that, and I quote, that the National Party is not going to exist after the next election unless you grow some spine and stand up. Have any of the Minister's colleagues expressed to her of their concern that the Deputy Prime Minister lacks a spine? Senator Mackenzie. Well, no, not at all, not at all. Um, you know, we are incredibly privileged to have been returned by regional Australians in every single seat uh, that we held prior to the election, and indeed to increase the number of senators here in this place. We're incredibly proud to represent rural and regional Australia, the seven million Australians that don't live in a capital city, and to actually hold the portfolios that underpin those communities' uh, economic prosperity, to also work to make sure we've got the social capital uh, and essential services that rural and regional Australians deserve. And that is about mobile phone connectivity. It's also about rural health service provision. And it is our political party that actually took a program to set up the Murray-Darling Basin Medical School Network, which will see an additional 3,000 GPs and nurses practising out in rural and regional Australia, Order, because Senator that's McKenzie. where they would Senator change. Ciccone, a final supplementary question. The uh, same protester also said, and I quote, that Barnaby Joyce was the only one who came out here yesterday, and he had some spine. Why is the former Deputy Prime Minister the only member of the National Party who has some spine? And is it any wonder that the National Party Room is turning against its leaders? Senator Mackenzie. Well, the minister that's responsible for giving us the Basin Plan, Senator Wong, at the time, I'm wondering whether she went out to meet no, the people that are actually subjected to living with that policy decision she took. Uh, and it was your side of government that put the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in place. It was this side of the parliament that has made significant changes, that have committed not to actually do any more buybacks, to actually cap the 1500, to have a socio-economic criteria agreed by state basin ministers to ensure that you can't take one more gigalitre out of the basin. For you to stand up here and complain about the effect of your plan on our communities I, would, I will, as Minister of Agriculture, host any single Labor Party senator in these communities over summer. Come and talk to 
my farmers. Come and talk Order, to Order, Senator Mackenzie. Time for the answer the has expired. Senator Mackenzie. Senator Van. Thank you, Order Mr. President. On my left, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's plan is working to combat family and domestic violence, including through this Christmas and New Year period? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Van for his question about uh, our commitment to preventing, addressing, and ultimately ending domestic violence against women and their children in Australia? This is a major issue for, for all Australians. But sadly, at this time of year, uh, the evidence through the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research and the Victorian Crime and Statistics Agency, the number of incidences of domestic violence often and nearly always do spike over the Christmas and New Year period. And it's a very important reminder that at this time it is absolutely crucial that people who need the support uh, of our government and the services that are provided that they are there for us to be able to support them. Under the fourth action plan against uh, women, uh, ending violence against women and their children, we have committed an unprecedented amount of money. $340 million has been allocated towards this absolutely crucial and vital service for Australians who are under particularly difficult circumstances. One very important part of this service is actually the 1800 uh, the Respect Line. This is the National Sexual Assault, Family and Domestic Violence uh, Counselling Service. It's free uh, and it is available uh, as a counselling service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The service provides for people the support for people who are experiencing or at risk of sexual assault for their families as, uh, and for other members who are impacted by an instance of domestic violence. It also supports survivors um, who have experienced abuse in the past their family members and uh, family members of other people who have been subjected to, to domestic violence. During this time when many of us are celebrating with our families and friends, we also need to make sure that the support services are available to victims of domestic violence and supply, supply them and support them in their time of need. We absolutely have to move towards zero tolerance for Order. violence Senator against Rustin. women. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister update the Senate on how women who need support and access government-funded services under the fourth action plan. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, violence against women and their children remains a very serious issue in Australia. Um, as we know, sadly, one in six women experience physical, physical or sexual violence by a current or a former partner. Under the fourth action plan, the Prime Minister committed that significant funding towards the prevention and early intervention through a number of initiatives which are outlined in the National Action Plan and its implementation plan. Of this funding, uh, a package of $82 million will go towards frontline services. $68 million is directed towards prevention strategies and $78 million to provide safe places for people impacted by domestic violence or family violence. We are also investing $35 million in support of prevention measures specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The scale of this investment means it is the largest support package to address the unacceptable high levels of domestic violence. This is a record number of funding. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of specialist services available to, to prevent violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Last month, uh, the government began another round of its Stop It At The Start campaign, which is a national uh, primary prevention campaign to help reduce the incidence of violence against women and their children. Stop It At The Start encourages us all to take a step back, to look at where the cycle of disrespect towards women actually starts. In childhood, with beliefs and attitudes boys and girls develop from a very, very early age. But it also helps adults to reflect on the impact of what they do and what they say, and to talk to young people about respectful uh, relationships and respect for each other. Furitra has a tremendous influence over young people and, and their lives, and we must make sure that we are all providing a very positive role model to ensure that the attitudes of children as they grow up become respect becomes a normal part of that attitude. And if we come together as a community, we can ensure that we can make Australia a safer place for all Australians. Senator Kitching. 
Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In 2019, Prime Minister Morrison has failed to tell the full story relating to one, his inappropriate contact with the New South Wales Police Commissioner regarding a criminal investigation into a member of his cabinet. Order. Two, his invitation to the head of the Hillsong Church, Brian Houston, to a state dinner in Washington, D.C. Three, his refusal to require Gladys Liu MP to make a statement to the parliament. Why does Prime Minister Morrison think Australians don't deserve to know the truth about his government? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the Australian people not only deserve the truth, they are getting the truth. And, that, and, that, and, the, Australian people, and the Australian people saw right through what they were getting from the Labor Party at the last election, which is, of course, why they re-elected a Liberal national government, which they know is delivering for them, and, of course, knew that the alternative was going to be a, a real a disaster for them. And you know, you know, I mean, I've, I've only recently found out. I mean, I'm being asked about Washington, and I'm being asked about uh, you know things over the last year. And I mean, the Australian people clearly knew that our future Prime Minister Shorten had a plan, a secret plan, a secret plan to make Senator Keneally the ambassador Order. to the United States. Senator, Senator Cormann, Senator Wong, on a on a on a point of order. Order. I, no. We're nearly at the end. I'll let Senator Wong raise a point of order. Order on my right. On my right. Order on my right, please. At least pretend to obey the chair. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. I know Senator Cormann knows a lot about secret plans. We saw, saw that this order. week. Order. But uh, really, I know you want, he seems to be obsessed with Senator Keeler Keneally. That's a matter for him. But the question, <laughs> the question relates. The question relates. Dear me, I probably should have said that. Yeah. The question actually relates to his government and his, his prime minister's failures. Um, a question like this, there is a very wide amount of discretion given to the person answering. But I do believe to be, the minister, the, the opposition is not directly relevant to the question. Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I was asked about uh, a question about dinners in Washington, and, and we now know that there was a secret plan for Senator Keneally to be at the dinner in Washington. Order. Senator, I remind the minister of the question. Senator Cormann. Well, I, I, on the point of order, I actually answered the question right up front. By mm. sa right up front. And I'm now... I, I, well, I, I, answered, I answered the question right up front, and I'm now providing, I'm now providing further context to the question that was asked, because I was asked about why we're not revealing the truth, and I, want, I think truth is something, truth telling is something that we need from all around the chamber, including from the Labor Party, because we the, now know the, we're, we're that Senator Keneally Senator doesn't Coleman, really I'm want to be in the I'm assuming we're now crossing. I, I grant a lot of discretion to the leaders at the table, and I take that as a point of order. It did cross into debating the matter. Um, I remind ministers answering questions that all the material in an answer must be directly re must be directly relevant. All the all the answer, all the, I, I'm trying to provide a ruling, Senator Wong. I'm trying to provide a ruling. I remind ministers all material in an answer must be directly relevant. But I do remind those asking questions that with a question like this that covers a great deal of material and has a great deal of what I might call loaded rhetoric in it. The minister has a great deal of discretion in answering it as well. Senator Cormann. Uh, on, on a point of order, uh, Prime Min uh, Mr President, uh, I would like to invite you to reflect on that ruling because, uh, and, and perhaps come back to the chamber at an appropriate time. In the past, I, I believe that presidents in the past have ruled that when there are politically framed and politically charged questions the way this one was, that there is quite a level of uh, discretion around uh, you know, the uh, definition of directly relevant. And I, I do I'm, I'm submit happy. to you that in the context of the question, the way that was framed, that my answer was absolutely directly relevant, and I would like it to reflect I'm, on I'm that. happy to reflect. Oh, Senator Wong on the point G of order. Given the submission the leader of the government has made, I also make a submission. And my submission, when you consider this, Mr President, is that what this matter goes to is the Prime Minister's failure to answer a question about Brian Houston, the Prime Minister's inappropriate contact with the police commissioner, and the Prime Minister's refusal to make a, the member for Chisholm, with all the public allegations against him, make a statement to the parliament. Those are not political questions. They are questions of accountability, transparency and government. Um, I, might, I might say, Senator Wong, you did raise those points. The, the end of the question was what I would call highly politically charged and loaded, and the minister is granted a great deal of... Is, is, well, I'm going to wait until there's silence before I continue talking.
I'm more than happy, as I always do, when people ask me to reflect on the rulings. My, my view is that directly relevant, as I said the other day, is a much tighter test than the old test, which basically said you could talk about the same subject matter. But I'm more than happy to reflect on that. I'm more than happy to reflect on that. Um, and I don't know if we'll be back this afternoon, but I'll make sure we do before the next question time. Um, I call Senator Cormann to continue his answer. I, Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Prime Minister Morrison has refused to stand Minister Taylor aside despite Minister Taylor and Minister Frydenberg's involvement in the Grasslands affair and Minister Taylor's use of doctored travel documents, do, doctored travel costs in official ministerial correspondence, which has led to a criminal investigation by the New South Wales Police. Why does Prime Minister Morrison refuse to ensure his ministers meet the standards he has set them? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I reject the premise of the question. The Prime Minister absolutely insists on uh, his ministerial standards being complied with, and, and I completely reject the premise of the question. But the question is why is Senator Keneally still in the, on the front bench of the Labor Party when she actually wants to be in Washington? Why did she take Senator Farrell's job as deputy leader when she actually doesn't want to be here? That is the question that Mr. Albanese must answer. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In October, Australian media outlets launched their Right to Know campaign in response to the Morrison government's culture of secrecy, and yesterday the Morrison government refused to make public the deal they did with Senator Lambie in order to repeal Medivac. Why doesn't Prime Minister Morrison think Australians have a right to know? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Australians absolutely have a right to know. And you know what the Australian people know? That we fixed up Labor's mess at our borders. Uh, that the Australian Order. people know how many boats arrived here illegally, how many people drowned under your watch. And they know that we fixed it. Order. They also know. They also know that your weak medivac laws, which you passed about 12 months ago, weakened our national security arrangements, and that the Senate this week voted to strengthen our national security arrangements. That is what the Australian people know. And the Australian people also know that there is no secret deal, as the Labor Party tries to allege. All there is— Order. Senator Wong on the point of order? Uh, well, point of order it possibly is a debating point. That is demonstrably incorrect out of Jackie Lambie's own mouth. I, 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 I think it's— it's not just possibly a debating point, Senator Wong. It is definitely not a point of order and a debating point. Senator Cormann, to Let continue. Let me say it very slowly for Senator Wong again. There is no secret deal. Only an explanation of good public policy. Only an, only an explanation order. of good public oh, policy. And, we will, and we, will, we will ensure that Australia's border remains secure. And we will continue to deal with the legacy case load that you left behind after six years of disastrous government. Order. Order. The time for the answer has I, expired. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice by Senator Mr. Corbyn. President. I seek leave to move a motion uh, to provide for the consideration of uh, legislation today. Is leave granted? There's no secret deal. Leave is not granted. Sorry? Leave, is, uh, leave was denied. Sorry, who, who has denied leave? Uh, Senator Patrick is indicating he denies okay. leave. Uh, pursuant to contingent uh, notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, uh, namely a motion to provide for a motion uh, relating uh, to consideration of legislation, uh, may be moved immediately in the term without amendment uh, or debate, and I move that the motion be now put. The question is that the motion be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. No, I, I actually saw a second mouth move. Um, I was watching very carefully. My, uh, the division. I, I will put it again if people would like me to clarify. Division. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. Continue to. Oh, sorry. Continue to ring the bells.
Ah, thank you. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be put. Moved by Senator Cormann. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 44, noes 13. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now put the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Cormann. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is, the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Cormann be agreed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seward, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 13. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I call the minister. Um, <clears throat> I move that, the, that a motion to provide for the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is the question be now put. Senator Patrick, is this a point of order? M Mr. President, uh, there's, I have some concern with the motion as circulated in the chamber. Uh, is point this the Okay, no, we, don't, we, we don't get to that yet. I've got to put the question about the question being put. Oh, you have an opportunity to raise that question if this succeeds. The question is the question being now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I now um, call the minister. No. You move, the move to the procedural matter. Yes. So the procedural motion, Senator Patrick, you now can now raise a point of order. Just, just raising a, a query in relation to. Uh, 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 point D. Uh, in the motion as circulated in the chamber, it has Roman numerals I, 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 V, I, V, I, V, V. Okay. And, and can I have some clarification in relation to that? Because I may wish to vote differently on each of those, okay. um, um, those points. I'm going to put the procedural motion before I come to that. The question is um, that the procedural motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, you're raising a point of order. Well, sorry, I, I, I wish to also move an amendment, which is why I wanted that clarified. No, uh, so, I, uh, after the question was put, this motion is now that the other uh, procedural motion be moved without debate or amendment. That this question now has to be put straight away. I've called that for the ayes. I now call the minister. I move the motion. Now, Senator Patrick, you would like that correction made on Roman four, five, six, or the. Yeah, the typo. So it would be Roman 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7, rather than three versions of Roman 4. That's correct. Is that correct? Can I take that as accepted by the chamber? So the minister has moved the motion. Um, can Are I indicate seeking... to, the, to the president that I, I wish to vote differently in respect of uh, A, the three dot points, and uh, also in respect of uh, D, uh, the Roman numerals? Okay, so you would like A and D put, uh, you would like A and D put together? I'd like uh, A to be dealt with, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to vote differently on the Australian Crime Commission Amendment, Special Operations and Investigation Bill, uh, as to the other two bills listed there. Okay, so you and want in, that bill separated out? That's correct. Okay. And in relation to point D, I yep. wish to vote, vote differently on each of those items. Yeah, you can, Senator Patrick. I've got to, I've got to deal with it in the most uh, expeditious way for the chamber, and I can group them into a way you'll vote yes and a way you'll vote no. But I can't do it differently. I'll let you ponder that while I separate. I deal with clause A, both bills other than the Australian Crime Commission bill. I'll let you sort out the other thing. The question is, um, the bottom two bills, farm household and special recreational uh, vessels, in clause A, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now to include the Australian Crime Commission bill in that. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. The question is that the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill be included in Clause A, which we've already voted for. Though the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Patrick, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 11. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Now I was planning on putting B, C and D together if there was no further request to separate the motion. Senator Patrick, are you happy to put B, C and D together? Senator Patrick, are you happy for me to put B, C and D together? Yeah, I am happy. Mr. Thank President. you, Senator Patrick. Appreciate it. The question is now that clauses B, C and D of that motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ayes have it. I think that concludes. We will now move to motions to take note of answers. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. I move that the Senate take note of answers given by the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. To question, a question asked by Senator Ayres today, today relating to the Morrison government's failures. Senator Ayres asked, how good is the Morrison government? Well, the answer is not good at all. Under this government, Australian families are struggling with a burden of record household debt, skyrocketing bills, stagnant wages, household spending growing at its slowest place in the global financial crisis and declines in real living standards. This summer, Australian families will have to deal with rising power prices and falling, failing reliability because of the ongoing climate wars and the consequent policy paralysis under this coalition government. And for the many Australians struggling to pay the bills, struggling to put food on the table and celebrate the holidays on just $40 a day, well, this Christmas will be very hard. And to those Australians, the phrase, how good is this? rings very hollow and tinny in their ears. Under this government, 120,000 older Australians are on the waiting list for home care. The interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care described the number of older Australians waiting for home care as unsafe practice, described it as neglect. As Senator Watt says, this is shameful. And last year, 16,000 of our older Australians died waiting for home care. I mean, let's pause to recognise what that means. 16,000 people died whilst waiting for the care they deserve. Working Australians are suffering under the worst wages growth since records began, and Australian workers are experiencing unprecedented wage theft, grappling with insecure work, facing increasing casualisation and fragmentation of work. And one in five workers in retail, construction, healthcare, accommodation and food service industries has been a victim of wage theft. And under this government, only almost two million Australians are either looking for work or looking for more work. But this government doesn't have a plan. So much for the Prime Minister's other mantra, if you have a go, you get a go, because it's not true. It's just not true. Instead of supporting working Australians, this government spent the past week trying to ram through a political attack on workers' ability to get together run their own union and determine who leads them in their so-called Insuring Integrity Bill. 
Their priority was attack on nurses, teachers, firefighters and police officers and their ability to organise for better pay and conditions. And we know this was just, about, just the start. Mr Porter's IR review, you know what it's about? Reducing protections. Senator Payne made that clear this week. A government that was not about reducing protections for working pe people would have done what she refused to do. She refused to rule out watering down unfair dismissal, refused to uh, rule out watering down other protections in the, in the Act. And you know she can't, and I'll take the interjections from those opposites because it's in your DNA, isn't it? Right. You want to go after working conditions. And step one, step one was always get rid of those that defend working conditions so you can go after those protections more easily. More easily. But at the same time, the government was throwing themselves at the cynically named Ensuring Integrity Bill. You know what? This government ends its year in tatters, with its integrity in tatters, defending the indefensible Angus Taylor. Defending the indefensible. Well, how good is Angus Taylor? Well, not. A, mi a, power, a minister who's misled the parliament six times, six times, over a botched, juvenile political hit job on the Lord Mayor of Sydney. And a minister who, in his very first speech, claimed to have gone to Oxford with Naomi Wolf when she was living in New York at the time. He will forever be remembered as the boy that cried Naomi Wolf. Now, I'll tell you what, you start, you start as you finish, don't you? He started by misleading and he's going to end with a mislead. He's a bloke who fails to declare his interests, fails to declare his interests in a company investigated for poisoning critically endangered grassland, a bloke, who, a minister who routinely fails to disclose his financial interests, but those opposite and the Prime Minister will not hold him accountable. You know, this government is great for Angus Taylor. It's great for Scott Morrison. It's great for their mates, but it's terrible for working people. It's terrible for working people. This government, they only care about themselves. They care about their jobs, their privileges, but they don't care about working Australians. It's one standard for you lot and, one, and your mates and another for everyone else. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, I just remind you we've got a 3.30 hard marker, but you'll be in continuation. The people of Queensland, Madam Acting Deputy President, knew who was standing up for working Australians, and that was the Liberal National Party government, which was why we were re-elected. Oh. Yes, I'll call it. She makes the time. You keep going, I'll call. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Acting Deputy <laughs> President. The people of Queensland, the people of Queensland, the working people of Queensland understood who was going to best serve their interests. And that was the coalition government. The coalition Senator government. Carr, please resume your seat. I remind senators we've got a hard marker and you'll be in continuation, Minister.